as I started to work with many people, and we would see symptoms often uh, connected with what we would think as being relatively uh, benign experiences. You know, falling off bicycles, uh, being in accidents, having invasive medical procedures. I mean, these all seem like ordinary things. And of course, things like abuse, uh, ne neglect, uh, molest molestation, rape, all of these things, of course, those, those are clear traumas, the trauma of war, those are clear traumas. But there was, I, I discovered there were so many other things that could cause these effects. And I, I thought, well, wait a minute. We have the same part of our nervous system, of our brains, to, that have to do with survival, that have to do with dealing with, pret, with, with predation, with threat, with danger, as animals do. And if animals develop the kinds of symptoms that we do, the kind of symptoms that Nancy developed, well, they wouldn't survive. Nor are their species. You know, it's an, it's an evolutionary, it's a Darwinian Olympic race. You know, if you, if you get the gold medal, you win. But there is no silver and there is no bronze. You either escape or you're... Don't. So if you lose that edge, as anybody who has trauma knows they lose that edge, then it wouldn't be possible for the animal or the species to survive. So I re realized that animals must have the same kinds of innate mechanisms or they must have innate mechanisms and that we also must have these same innate well when I studied animal animal behavior and and one of the reasons why this image of the tiger came to me is because I was a, my graduate work initially was in the neuroethology lab of Donald Wilson who sadly uh, was killed and I had to it was very sad for me um, but we were taking a, a kind of an informal graduate seminar and one of the professors was presenting some work on what's called tonic immobility. When animals are immobilized, they freeze, right? Playing a possum, mm -hmm. if you take a pigeon and hold a bird in your hands and restrain it, even without fear, it stops fighting, it just, or it's, it, exactly, it stops moving. And if the animal is frightened, it stays in longer and longer. So I started again doing more research, but I'm sure that that image come from, came from that graduate seminar because I realized that she was feeling immobile and was feeling terrified and that this image of escape, you know, came clearly for what animals do because after they've been in this immobility response and the predator is gone, they escape, right? You see sometimes where the, I, I have some videos showing a, a cheetah chasing down a gazelle. The cheetah grabs the gazelle, takes the gazelle down to the ground. The gazelle is dead. It's not moving. It appears to be dead. and. The, the, the cheetah is chewing on, on, on her neck, on its neck. Of course, the, 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 the uh, cheetah is, is exhausted from the chase. And so the hyenas come in and, the, and, and scare and sh shoes off the, the cheetah. And then the hyena starts chewing on the gazelle. Then the, ch the, the, the uh, cheetah comes back again and starts, you know, getting a little more energy and, 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 and backing off the hyena, the gazelle gets up and runs away as nothing, as though nothing had happened. What happens with people is we become afraid of this, the actual sensations of coming out of the immobilization response. Also, when animals come out of the immobility response, if the predator is still around, the, the, the prey will counterattack. I've even seen a mouse counterattack a cat. The cat catches the mouse, bats it around, it goes into immobility, or holds it, it goes into immobility. Well, the, the cat wants the, 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 the game to continue, so the cat bats it around, tries to revive it. It gets up and, I, and, you, and, and, and runs as quickly as it can in any direction. But again, I've seen times when it actually went right into the cat, you know, hit its nose or maybe even bit its nose. The cat is completely 
you know, dazed for that moment, and then away the animal goes. But anyhow, these sensations to escape when we come out of the immobility or to counterattack this surge of aggression, for most people, that in itself becomes frightening. So we stop the very things that would take us out of the shock reaction, out of the immobility. We, we keep ourselves, we, we perpetuate the, the immobility response by continually frightening ourselves. So gradually what I would learn or I would help my clients learn is that way they could touch into these sensations one drop at a time. Mm -hmm. Again this idea of titration. I, I, I borrowed the term from chemistry. So you, if you take for example one beaker of hydrochloric acid, very strong acid, and another beaker of uh, sodium hydroxide, caustic soda, all, if you put your finger in either of those, your finger's going to be gone. They're both extremely, uh, the acid and a base of extreme corrosive ability, capacity. And if you put them together, what happens? You get an explosion. But the final result of that explosion is water and salt. Mm -hmm. right? Not only neutral, but necessities of life. So I, I started to think, but if you're a smart chemist, you don't do that. Exactly. You take one drop at a time, you drop down the one drop of the hydrochloric acid into the caustic soda, and you get a psh, like an Alka-Seltzer fizzle. Psh, another one, like an Alka-Seltzer fizzle. Another one. And maybe on the 25th drop, all of a sudden, the salt starts to form around the sides and water is released. So that was the idea of, 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 of finding a way to touch into bodily experience in a way that was safe and that each time gave the person more of an island of safety, more of a sense that they had the capacity to defend themselves and to deal with these sensations so that they became less and less frightening. And sort of like if you look at it this way, it's like here is the trauma, okay? And as you loosen the trauma, where's the trauma? And that's what I was learning with my clients. If we could just touch and learn to befriend our body sensations, that was the key, befriending our bodily sensations then that let us develop this capacity of resilience, of confidence, and really even of joy. What I would discover with Nancy and many, many, most of my early clients was that they would experience as a side effect tremendous joy and peace because by liberating that energy and being able to live that energy this is a tremendous, tremendous gift. You know, there's, uh, if I take the liberty of mix my metaphors a little bit, you know, in the, in the yogic, in the Eastern yogic uh, uh, systems of, of spiritual transformation, there's one approach, it's called the kundalini, where you release this latent energy and as the person is able to integrate this energy. They are able to transform it in the different spiritual ways. But I realize that this so-called first chakra is the chakra of basic survival. And so when a person is traumatized, that's the, the energy that is mobilized. That's the energy that allows a hundred pound mother to lift the car off a trapped child and pull the child out. She may break her bones, tear her muscles, break her bones. But she does that. This surge of energy, again, if we have it all at once, it's too much, but if we learn to touch to it and to let it move through our whole body experience, then we really come home to ourselves in a profoundly deeper way.